Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anise Raouf. I am the Arts and Health Grants Program Manager at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. I work in partnership on behalf of RISCO with the Rhode Island Department of Health to advance the integration of the arts for the benefit of individual and community health and well being for all Rhode Islanders. I just want to share a reminder that this session is being recorded so that others may access this in the future. Turn off your camera if you prefer not to be visible in the recording. And if you would like closed captions, you can click to turn them on on the bottom of your screen. I'll start with a land acknowledgement. It is risk as practice to acknowledge that the grounds on which we are meeting are indigenous lands. Our offices in Providence and all of Rhode Island are on the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett, Nipmunk, Okanoka, and Wampanoag people. RISC is a committed ally and as artists, we honor the indigenous people, their ancestors, the culture and the artistic representation, past, present and future. We recognize the continued existence and contributions of indigenous people to our society. The In Conversation Arts and Health Program is a series of periodic events, virtual or in-person to come together, hear about our work going on in the arts and the health field, particularly in Rhode Island and to share thoughts, ideas and resources as we build a creative community of well-being together. Today's topic, creative support for students, leveraging arts to address the mental health crisis, is presented in partnership with RISCA, the Rhode Island Department of Health and the core organization. We will discuss this mental health crisis and how the arts help students thrive in and out of the classroom. Today's format is a bit different from our previous in conversations. We, um, each of our presenters will take a turn asking and answering a question. After we have finished the formal q and I will open this up to you, our attendees, to ask questions via the chat. I wanna thank Emma Becker, Emma Becker, uh, RISCA's education coordinator who is helping with tech today and will monitor the chat. Thank you, Emma. I also wanna thank Sherry Brown, who's the co-chair of the Arts and Health Steering Committee for her valuable help in planning these conversations. Now, I want to introduce and thank my amazing colleague, Maggie Anderson, who's RISCA's Arts and Education Director for co-hosting and planning today's important conversation. Thank you, Anissa. My name is Maggie Anderson, and I am the Arts and Education Director at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. In my role, I work to ensure that all Rhode Island students have access to comprehensive arts education, whether that be through formal school day arts classes or in collaboration with the community-based arts organizations in their neighborhoods. It is my honor to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Jackie Cotillo. And I'm gonna wait till she joins me here in the spotlight. Hey, there she is. Jackie is the Assistant Clinical Director for the New England Offices of Youth Villages and has a small private practice caseload. She has worked to develop resources to target mental health crises with youth, utilizing, system, utilizing a systems approach to promote long-term change. Jackie, there's been a lot of reporting and research on the state of child and adolescent mental health post-pandemic. In your opinion, is it, is it fair to say we are in a moment of crisis? Thanks, Maggie. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to be here. I think it's very fair to say that we're in a moment of crisis now. And honestly, we've been in a moment of crisis for a really long time, even pre-pandemic. If we think about the word crisis and what that actually means, it almost sets us up to be acting reactively instead of proactively. And so thinking about how arts and education can help marry with mental health concerns, we wanna be shifting our language and our thought process for everyone on this call, students, supports, um, everyone involved, to think about what would proactive thinking look like to manage current mental health concerns. When I was prepping for this, I was thinking a lot about what expectations we have on our students, what expectation we have on our professionals in the mental health field, in the education field, in the arts field. And it almost seems to me like we are trying to meet pre-pandemic expectations with post-pandemic resources and skills. We think about the two and a half, three years that we sort of lost with pandemic in all of the facets, right? Like we don't have the same coping skills that we had. It looks a little bit different. Our kids and young adults and young people are um, maybe quote unquote behind where peers were five, seven, eight years ago, but they're not behind where their peers are. And so we need to reallocate our mental health and our um, abilities 
to think about what is their normal and what should their expectations be given the situations that they've encountered. Thanks so much. So actually just last month, Youth Truth released a report um, where 48% of students surveyed said that feeling stressed, anxious, and depressed made it hard for them to perform in school. This is, to your point, up from pre-pandemic numbers, but what is maybe more alarming is that those same 48% of students reported um, less, feeling like, feeling less than pre-pandemic that they had a trusted adult in the building to go to. So we're, we have these higher numbers of stress and anxiety um, and, and less in school supports. To, in your opinion, based on the clients that you're seeing outside of school, does that corroborate with what you're seeing? And what are some of the things that um, our folks on the call today who are in schools can be uh, paying attention to, to your point, to, to clock what the new normal might be? Yeah, I definitely see that in both private practice as well as clinical practice. My several thoughts include that, you know, resulting of pandemic as well as resulting of, you know, sort of where everyone is at with responding to educational demands, there's also an increase in students requiring supportive services within the classroom. And so our teachers are stretched thinner, our guidance counselors are stretched thinner, classroom aides are stretched thinner. And so there's less bandwidth to be able to meet the needs of kids who are in um, a mental health crisis or who are just seeking day-to-day -day support. And so first off, we need to be able to monitor and manage those resource needs internally. I would also say that with um, coming off of the pandemic, a lot of area schools, a lot of area hospitals have changed their visitor policy. And I don't mean like grandma coming in to read a book, but even allowing outside clinicians the ability to come in and help create and implement and develop safety plans, coping skills plans, those sort of in the moment activities, that availability has decreased recently um, as we're transitioning back from pandemic. And I understand all of the safety concerns and, and the health concerns there, but I think that that also limits how many students feel like they can access individuals. Similarly to what you were saying, Maggie, I was looking at the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey so a 2019 version and a 2021 version with data, data released recently um, indicates an increase in all domains related to depression and suicidality. So things like feeling sad or hopeless almost every day for two or more weeks, seriously considering attempting suicide, making a plan, and attempting suicide within the past 12 months. That's a very large increase on some very, very serious issues. So helping students advocate for what they need is a huge step in this. And that can be through a trusted relationship, that can be through a peer, that can be through a mentoring program. Um, but I feel like we all need to pay very close attention to how our kids and young adults are asking for services or asking for supports. And that may be behavioral. So the kid who is having behavioral struggles in the class may actually be reaching out for some additional guidance, some additional support, some additional one-on-one -on -one time. They just don't have the skills to be able to ask for that. Thank you, Jackie. I'd like to turn it over to Kylie, who is our student. She is a senior at Tiverton High School, and we're so excited to have you. Thanks, Kylie, for joining us. Hi, I'm Kylie. Um, I'm a student at Tiverton High School. I'm a senior. I've been working in the arts since I was like six years old. Um, I used to be painfully shy until I met Gloria and then started working in theater. And I don't know, that's how I like was able to express myself because it was like, I wasn't being me. I could be whatever I wanted to be up on stage. And now I can do this <laughs> and talk in front of so many people on the Zoom call. <laughs> we're so excited to have you. And I promise we're gonna try and keep it less scary. So what does it feel like to be a full-time student right now? Well, everything you've said, stressed, there's so much pressure. Um, and it's not just the students that are feeling it. You can tell it's also teachers, administration. Um, you can tell nobody's comfortable where they are because it's just so much pressure on everybody, pressure to get things done. And Again, like you said, not a lot of resources for the students to talk to anybody in school. 
Um, and even when you do try to voice your concerns, it's usually not taken seriously because you're just a kid and how could you know what depression feels like? And so it's a lot of that, <laughs> a lot of stress. Okay, all right. That resonates totally with me. How has art been able to impact your growth? I mean, you said you were super shy and now you're able to be here. What have you done? How have you grown? Well, when Gloria and I first met, I was four. I could not speak to anybody except for my parents and my sister. I would push them away. Somebody would come up to me, oh, so cute. And I would scream. I'd be like, no, and like back away. And then I started in the arts and working with acting and being on stage. And it made me come out of my shell. It was like, my mom was, was always like, you were bitten by the acting bug because it was like all of a sudden I could talk to this theater of people while I was up on stage when I wasn't able to do that before. And now it's a like reliever of my stress. So I go to core or I go out and do like, help with the little kids and do their acting for middle school and stage manage. And it's just a way for me to be able to let out all the stress and focus my energy on something else. Great. So it sounds like this is a really solid coping skill for you and a really solid growth skill for you. How are you going to take what you've learned over the past, you know, 14, 15 years as you continue your journey, whatever that looks like? Well, it's a great way to learn how to public speak, which, and work with people you've never talked to before, different kinds of people from anywhere where they might have a different thing, view of the world than you, and you could, you're able to express how you feel um, without feeling any judgment most of the time. And you're able to just, I don't know, have conversations like this and I don't know, say what's important, get spread a message. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like theater is a really great outlet for you. I'm certain that others would resonate with other forms of art, you know, whether that's dancing or yoga or cre uh, like making, actual, making items um, in their practice. Is anything else resonating with you? Uh, everything I okay. love flirts um but I usually focus on like theater and doing all that and helping out with like the little littler kids yeah yeah so in addition to a coping skill and a, a strategy for you it also sounds like it has brought you a community so yeah. now you have a school group or community groups that you're a part of and can share that love yes Totally. And everybody, it's a space where we know when we step in the auditorium or step on stage, it's a space where we can all be ourselves without feeling judged, talk about how we're feeling the, that day. We even can stop rehearsals and say, all right, we need to just sit and talk about what happened today. If something happened within the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a space where you, everybody can feel comfortable. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Um, I think Gloria is next. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I'm gonna introduce Gloria Christ, who is the founder and artistic director of the core organization, um, arts integrated specialist and passionate advocate for inclusive arts access and arts outreach for all children, K through 12. <laughs> Boom, we're sharing <laughs> musical chairs here. Thank you, Kylie. Yeah. Okay, so, ask my question? Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about, um, about what I do and why and, um, and, and how it ties into these to this conversation that we're having. Um, I have been working with young people for many, many years, mostly in a, in a theater performing arts situation. 
but also um, implementing um, arts integration and attaching it to behavior, emotional, um, emotional modifications or emotional outlets, and really talking about meeting each student where they are, even if they're a kindergartner, because that's where you're going to find how the arts are going to play a role in, um, in reaching that self-expression. So, so in the context and the content of where we are and where we've been with levels of stress and anxiety and, and what Kylie was just speaking about, it is really important for arts educators, for um, out of school organizations, for theater companies that are working with K through 12 to really understand that yes, theater and all arts integration and art form as a template for learning and creating is so super important, but we cannot negate the mental health component, not anymore. And what this means is arts educators really need to become more educated themselves about what that means. What is, what is meeting a student where they are mean? What does whole brain heart centered work mean? Um, and, and yes, there is a value to an end product, um, whether it be a, a piece of ceramic or a sculpture or a theater piece or um, a poetry slam or a dance piece, but none of that is going to gel if the collective of students you're working with are constantly being dysregulated or having a bad day. And so what we've done this year is really go moment to moment to moment. And sometimes those moments mean we have to just stop and everyone has to take a breath and we have to start working from, you know, stop working from, you know, from here up, which everything is in the head and really become grounded and then reset again. And that's not taking the responsibility away from what is expected of a creator, but it's, it is um, helping individuals understand that there is accountability along with the creative process. So you have a question? For yes, me. I do. <laughs> what does consistent whole brain heart centered arts integration look like in after school and out of school programming? So it is all of these things. It is caring for the well-being of each student you meet um, with an arts template. Um, and so that means safety and well-being is paramount. Um, that means this year I've had to place more phone calls to make sure that a kid is safe, um, to make sure there's a support structure in place, um, and, and make sure that I am implementing those safety measures in addition to a rehearsal process or seeing that our embodied dancing uh, for kindergartners is it, you know, once you start moving and stuff starts bubbling up, you, you're going to have to address it in a healthy, mindful way. So the student learns and the creative process um, moves forward. Where, I, I, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so let me go on to the most amazing Karen. Um, Karen Barboza is an assistant principal at Woonsocket High School and Career in Tech. She comes to this conversation today with a perspective on arts in school from her seven years with the community-based organization, River's Edge Arts. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, this is a really wonderful conversation to be a part of. Um, and I see a lot of arts um, folks on the call and realizing that I like I should, would have been be great to maybe get more of the traditional um, teachers here to hear all of this. And certainly what I've been seeing from an administrative point of view um, is exactly as Jackie um, explained it and as Kylie's been experiencing it. Um, so you know, we are coming to this with um, a, a lot of concerns for our students in this time. And as an administrator, 
Um, I do see the value and correlation to integrating arts into everything that we're doing in the school and not just from an academic component, because there's certainly an ability to infuse it there, but as also as our response to helping students with their social emotional um, strategies and skills and tools that they um, can carry with them for the rest of their lives. Um, and I also feel it's really important as an administrator to pay attention to what our students are responsive to. And this might be unique to Winsocket, though I have a feeling Kylie might feel that this is also true in Tiverton and probably schools across our street, state. But our students are super responsive to performance, um, any performance. So if someone who doesn't even know what they're doing gets up and is willing to play a song that they've never played before or show a dance step that they're just learning, there's an immediate support around that student um, from, from what I perceive to be that they're willing to kind of put themselves out there. I've never seen a student ridiculed for any type of performance at our school. Like get is killed for other things, but not when it's performance based. So um, I feel like that's an area that we need to embrace. That's something that our students are responsive to. And so how can we um, be supporting opportunities um, to build that more into the school day to create the climate and culture that we want for our school? So it's it's an infrastructure of allowing students to be seen and heard. That's the performance piece, right? Mm -hmm. So what is working well at your school and what would what and what would you want to change about the arts integration or feel needs improving to better serve the students' education and health and well-being? That's a great question. So things that are working well at our school, um, some of it is teacher driven right now. And I really honor them for that because they come up with the idea and it's like, oh my gosh, yes, we should be doing that. So we have um two of our arts teachers um, really see are always looking for new opportunities. So one has been blending more art therapy type instruction into their lessons. And because it's elective based, she sees a cross section of the student body um, all throughout the year. And so she's been doing smaller, almost like mini lessons that have an art therapy component to it. So if you're feeling stressed or you're feeling confused or you need to get focused using you know, this type of activity, um, could be useful. So taking it from what she's teaching them to be not just something that happens in the art class, but how you can use this um, in other classes and just in your day-to-day -day life. Our other art teacher really focuses on um, that it's okay to make mistakes and infuses that into everything that they do. And um, when you go to observe her classes, you can see how having implemented that mindset from the beginning of the year that you have these students who are so much more comfortable talking with each other and taking risks and just being almost like silly sometimes with their work or um you know just growing not only as an artist but also in their um personal development um and then the other place that we see this working really well in regards to the social emotional part is specifically with our performance programs. So music, dance, theater, um, you know, similar to what Kylie was saying is we've had students who once they lock onto that, that's a, that's an area where they somehow, even though it's like, you're the most vulnerable, cause you're like about to go put yourself on stage. It, you know, it brings out maybe this level of bravery that they didn't have before. And for some of our, well, for a lot of our students, once they get involved in it, then we start seeing that benefit in um, their behavior and in their academic performance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think that goes to the mindset of our teachers in a lot of ways, because that's just how they operate. And it makes me as an administrator in this conversation, make me be more mindful about how we can be intentional when we're hiring or when we're educating, that it's not just by, oops, that's my, my time, um, but, but that we're not just, um, it's not just happening by happenstance and luck, but that it's something that we're intentionally building into our school system, that we have more individuals like that. Yes. Um, so my, I'm going to shoot this question back to Maggie, um, is what is Riska doing to support this work? 
Um, well, thank you for that question. And thank you, Karen, for being a school-based administrator who's brave enough to say that we need to be intentional yes. with our arts um, <laughs> for our students. So that's really exciting for me to hear. But thank you for the question. Um, so what is the risk uh, education team doing? So here's the thing, arts education, the way we talk to all of our stakeholders about education, arts education, is that it is not another competing priority, right? But rather it is an essential part of the student experience. And in our state, in the state of Rhode Island, it's also a graduation requirement. And so therefore the arts should be intentionally, quoting our girl Karen, used as a tool to address the most critical priorities that local um, that LEAs are facing. And so today let's talk about that in sort of the context of mental health, right? And student mental health. So what RISCA is doing to support the, the use of robust arts education as a, as a student support for mental health. First and foremost, we are a granting organization. So RISCA has a grant category um, called Project Grants in Education. These are grants of up to $10,000 for schools or community-based organizations to do uh, sequential participatory, participatory arts learning projects where, this, where student voice is being centered, where there is a relationship between the art making and another component of the school day. So we're happy to fund in that way. We also uh, support and maintain an incredibly robust roster of teaching artists who, um, so we have something called the Rhode Island Teaching Artist Roster. And here on my screen, I see a bunch of our teaching artists uh, give an emoji if you're one of them. There are so many awesome artists here on the call right now. Um, but these are individuals who are not only masters in their craft, but they have some formal training with many of them working with youth so that the arts can be incorporated into a school-based experience. And that burden doesn't come on our already stretched thin classroom teachers or administrative staff, right? There's training that's happening here to bring arts into our schools via a teaching artist. Um, and the other thing that we do and we do a lot of is we educate so that you can advocate. Uh, a new resource to RISCA that we can't wait to spend all this year and next year talking about is the Rhode Island Arts Education Data Dashboard. Um, we will drop a link to that. But this is uh, using all of the data that schools here in Rhode Island already have to report to the Rhode Island Department of Education. We've worked with a team at Quadrant Research and we've joined the National Arts Ed Data uh, Project so that we can see in real time what access and enrollment to arts education classes in our state look like. And with that publicly available information, all the way down to the school level. So you could access that website and see what arts education is happening in your child's school. We are able to empower you to have conversations with the administrators, the school committees, and we will happily be available to you to talk about what sort of things you can ask for, how to, how to ask your school committee to spend their uh, title funds, towards better arts education opportunities. If you work at an arts organization, how to formulate a program and make an ask to either your governing board or to a potential donor or to a partnering school where your organization is uh, located to provide additional arts education to a school that might not have that opportunity during the school day. So, uh, but one of the things that's most important for people on the call to remember is that everyone at a state arts agency is, uh, is a publicly accessible employee you should contact us, you should email us if you have a question about what arts education looks like for you. Uh, we are here to answer those questions and have those dialogues with you and we love doing it. And I will let my colleague Anissa answer as well. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Karen, for asking this question about what we are doing. Um, in my role uh, with the Arts and Health, one of the important things we did was uh, create a partnership with the Rhode Island Department of Health which elevates this, um, the importance of the arts being integrated and the value it has for our individual health and community well-being. And so the partnership that I have with the Department of Health, I know Stephen Boudreau is on this call, is amplifying the work that is happening, making, um, making sure that we're spotlighting that this is an important need and that arts is a really important integral part 
of this piece, that it's not a Band-Aid added on later. It's an important piece that we need to be thinking from the ground up integrally into how we function. And so, as the presenters have said, Jackie and Karen, you know, this, this is important, it's valuable. And so my work with Stephen in the Department of Health is making sure that this stays as part of the conversation. Um, and out of that partnership at RISCA specifically, we want to support um, the programming that's happening. And so I manage a newly restructured arts and health grant. It replaces a grant program we had before, which is the Project Grants in Healthcare. Um, this expanded grant program, which is no longer limited to just healthcare organizations, it's recognizing the need, the broader need in the community, awards up to $9,000 to nonprofits and arts and cultural organizations, organizations for non-clinical arts experiences, that are the main focus of the project. And they take place in health-based or community spaces with an intended health or public health benefit. Um, and then with my partnership with the Rhode Island Department of Health, we run an artist in residence program, which is embedding an artist within a state health and human service agency to work alongside staff to address specific health challenges. What's exciting about this is the emphasis is on process. The artistic experience fosters innovative problem solving um, it's not about the end project because it's really about the process that happens with the thinking, um, building a trust based relationships to advance the health priorities and sort of co creating things together in response to the needs um, that happens in real time and that's really important. Um, and the other piece is hosting these arts and health in conversation series that we started this year in response to coming out of the pandemic, wanting to hear what everybody is doing. Um, you know, providing an opportunity for us to connect in person and on Zoom, um, learning from each other and how we can create and support these arts interventions um, and hopefully help us, our individuals and communities and overall resiliency as we've seen here, there's a lot of need. Um, and if you have um, suggestions for future topics or presenters, you know, you can email me, I'll have my email in the chat. Um, so that's what we're doing. I wanna now, um, I want to ask our group again um, to come forward. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about what's what people have been doing. What what's the path moving forward? If we look forward. You know, how do we leverage the arts to address the mental health crisis and best support our students? I know there's been some great examples um, about what people have been doing, but also, you know, what are what are practical things and what are some dream things? What what's what can we do? So I'm going to start with Gloria to answer that question. Um, thank you. This has been such an invigorating conversation and I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, a dream for me would be to combine everything that we've spoke of. The intentional arts piece where educators and administrators are saying, wow, this has got to happen in my school um, would, would be such an incredible dynamic force for districts to implement because it's not just about the arts. It's intentional arts education that's attached to an intentional well being process. Um, so I, I want to, that we'll continue doing that as an arts nonprofit. I will continue doing that with the ways that I teach. And, um, you know, I would just really encourage um, those who love to implement arts making to, to understand that, yes, it is about implementing everything that you love to share, but we're at a different level working with K through 12 and there's gotta be some awareness of those behavioral, emotional, um, social conditions that are gonna come into the room. Um, so that means self-care and that means carefully attending to those that are in your process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kylie, do you wanna share something about the path going forward? What do you see? I completely agree with Gloria. Um, I also think that there needs to be more resources for the students in the schools because as Jackie touched up on it, there's not a lot of people uh, that, or not a lot of adults in the building that kids feel comfortable going and talking to things, talking about things like this too. Um, and sometimes kids can't stay after school for the arts. So there needs to be a resource in the school building during the day. Wouldn't that be great? I know, so just a dream. Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
Yes, thank you for, for highlighting that important need that it needs to be integral through the day where we students are spending most of their time. Um, Karen, do you wanna to add to that? Oh, but the path forward, yeah. Oh, Karen, you're on mute. There we go, okay, thank you. Um, wouldn't be a Zoom call if that didn't happen at least one point, so. Um, I think it's twofold um, in many regards because there still is such, there's still work to be done just to infuse the arts into schools in general, let alone utilizing them in all the different ways that it can be utilized. So at our school, I definitely see the continuation of trying to blend arts into core content areas so that it becomes more natural that it's just interwoven in with everything. And it's not just a standalone elective class for art kids. And I'm not an artist, so I don't really want to do it. Or, you know, um, that whole mentality is, is one of the layers to it. Um, and we've been making some inroads with that and certainly having the career and tech center with our graphics program and our digital media program, um, that helps because it becomes like, oh, we'll ask them to do that thing that we need them to do. And it's, so it, um, it be, does become a little bit more seamless, but there's still much work to be done there. Um, as we were talking, I just had this other thought, which you guys might be like, yeah, this already exists. And if it does, great, share it with me. But I'm realizing that um, there is a lot of overlap, I think, with like the design thinking and the design process that artists use and a lot of the pillars that we utilize in regards to SEL learning. Mm -hmm. And so how can, if we're already doing a lot of SEL education with our educators, how can we embed some of that design thinking from the arts world into it so it makes a more seamless connection and they can be supporting each other and not seen as separate? Beautiful. Yeah, that's great. And if it doesn't exist, can someone help make it exist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and I think by saying it out loud and having lots of people on this call is, you know, is creating a movement to have more people yep. you know, demand some of these things. So uh, I want to turn over to Jackie to share what, what you think. Yeah, so mental health is a tricky sort of topic to try and approach in the independently, right? Like that's why we're all in this community and all fighting the good fight for resources and support. I like to think of helping professionals, including artists, those involved in education as more of an airplane sort of mentality, right? Like you have to put your own oxygen mask on before you can help the larger community. Mm -hmm. And so wanting to make sure that in an effort for self-care and self-creativity that we're all honoring our own skills, talents, and needs and really capitalizing on those opportunities to continue to integrate art in our own world, because then it becomes a little bit more natural to speak about it to others and really incorporate it as just part of day-to-day -day living. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. We've been talking about that a lot lately too, for the educators, caregivers, and the artists, you know, we talk about like the artists are brought in to sort of help people. And we then think about like the artists themselves are not necessarily the, the ones that can fix everything for everybody and they need their own care, just like the teachers, the administrators, people in all different fields. So recognizing that and that analogy of putting on your own oxygen mask and taking care of yourself so you're ready to take care of other people or be part of a community of care is, is really important. So thank you. Um, I would like to now um, have you know we have a lot of people on this call we would like to hear from all of you i know there's been some things happening in the chat um some resources but we'd like you to share your thoughts about this topic um and so if you have questions post them in the chat and maggie and i will share them with our panel so if you have a question you have it for a specific person you can just note that you know you want to ask or if it's just general then um, people can take turns answering that I will just say there was a general question about follow-up on resources and contact information. So everyone who signed up for this webinar, um, we are recording it as we mentioned at the top and uh, you will receive a follow-up email with uh, the link for the recording and all of the resources that we've mentioned today. 
Yes, and if our presenters want to share um, emails or websites in the chat, you can go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to put my email here if anybody has questions, you know, later on or want some more information. And, uh, and don't be shy if you have questions. I see uh, Susan from NASA's got her hand up. Did you want to unmute Susan? Yeah, thank you so much. This is just such an amazing webinar. Thank you so much to everybody for this excellent discussion. Um, I was intrigued by the comment about sort of, it, um, it went in a different direction than I expected, but the comment about everybody competing for the same resources. And I wonder whether from the point of view of the state arts agency and the LEA or even the state education agency and others, what do you all recommend or what would you hope for that artists like ourselves or parents, maybe even students, what role could we play to help alleviate the pressure of a lot of need and fewer resources than we would like that have to get distributed to everybody? How can we support that? How, what role can we play to make sure that there are resources available, plenty of them? Thank you for that question. And I will also raise up um, that there's a, there's a similar question in the chat from Alex about community members and, and what they can do for support in the schools. Um, and I will add for our panelists as, a, as another layer to Susan's great question and Alex's question, how do we break through the noise? So how can we, how can the community rally for supports and how can we break through the noise? Well, I, I think we have to make more noise and that's difficult sometimes for creatives because we're so protective of our creative sources and resources. Um, you, and I know that's a lot easier said than done, um, but it's just a constant or consistent way to advocate for what is needed. And, um, you know, as much as, and I know school budgets are tough, you know, particularly in Tiverton, you know, we've been level funded for decades. Um, and so that always stretches, you know, where, where the dollars go. Um, the more parents can say how important an arts process is to their student, the more noise is generated for the intentional creative process to happen in the school that's attached to direct thinking, that's attached to education and creative problem solving. Yes. Karen, as an administrator, what can we do to support schools? As an administrator, what can RISCA do? Or Riska and the community, this. Well, was this to Alex's growing. question? I'm sorry. I was just sorry. I was deep in thought on a question. I thought, like, how can the community support schools? Was that, um, yeah, how can community members support art in schools? That's what I was kind of, am I allowed to? <laughs> I was gravitating towards that yeah. one. Um, so I was like, oh gosh, it's such a, I was like, how, how does one break into the schools? Um, well, one good thing to an important thing I think to know is that whenever you want to volunteer in a school, you're going to have to have a BCI check. So I think sometimes we like we'll have parents, we'll have community members who are like, "I'll I'll come in," but it um it's it, it's a little bit of a process, not terribly so because now the BCI process is so much easier. But just knowing that that will be what is needed, and if you're open to that and you're like, great, sounds good, I got an issue, I can get that, then that is going to be like the first barrier out of the way. Um, and, you know, then I was trying to think, okay, well, if you don't know <laughs> the people in this, because it's not always the administration that you're going to be able to get a response from when you call, you know, you, you call 
the AP's office and they're like, I don't do anything with art. Like, who is this person? Like, good luck to them. Um, and it really, in so many ways, does have to do with who you know. Um, so because what you have to do is you have to figure out what the need of the school is. Um, the best is when what the need of the school is aligns with maybe the skill set or gift that you have to share. But if you come in just initially like, oh, I have this thing, can I do it? It's it the chances of it getting picked up, unfortunately, tend to be slim or it'll be um, it tends to be slim. So it's about it is doing that like networking, hustling, um, relationship building. One of the great things is that Maggie um, has already done a lot of the hustling and relationship building. <laughs> so if you literally like, if you're like, I'm a person in the community and I really wanna help out my local school, Maggie will know who the kindred spirits are at that school that you should get connected with. And then if you're willing to get the BCI, then it might be like a match made in heaven. Um, and, but being open to hearing what it is that the school needs, because the school needs might be SEL and which it is, you know, um, one of many needs. And so when, but you'll, ha you could have a response to that need that's unique, but really works for that moment that the school might not have thought of. But, um, and so I think it, it'll be around having that conversation and then Riska could fund the idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if that helps answer the question, but that's my top of mind answer. Thank you for that. I, th I think something, first of all, the, the chat is fire. So if you are not on a device where you can see everything that's happening in the chat right now, it's pretty incredible and it's really exciting. But right. I think coming back maybe to Susan's original question and, and as we start talking about budgets, right? One of the most incredible things I ever uh, heard at a conference was that um, a budget is a moral document, right? And and so when we think about building a shared community, and I'm looking at Lori's comment right now, right? We rise when we lift up others. And Karen's absolutely right. So again, the whole risk of education philosophy is that arts is not an additional priority. Arts is this thing that you have to do anyways, because it's a requirement. But if you do it well, it can address your most critical priority. So mm -hmm. in this moment where funding uh, and certainly federal relief funding, as we sort of start to spend that down, but funding and funders are very interested in addressing school climate and the social, emotional and mental wellness needs of our students. And so here's a moment for collaboration, lifting up others and coming at that money from the sense of it, a budget being a moral document and saying, okay, here's what our, our school is getting this influx of federal funding to support uh, school climate. We know because of incredible individuals like Kylie and their testimony that, that the impact on mental health can be made through performance or any different types of art and how are we coming together and how can things like the arts education data dashboard and the stuff that we know about how entitlement funding works inform you and your community of artists and parents and concerned citizens to put together some sort of killer presentation so that Karen's job as an administrator is easy because she can say to the school committee, this is how we want to spend this money to achieve this goal, right? So, and it's done through conversations like this and it really um, can be done here in Rhode Island very well. Um, and to my colleagues that I see here from other states, um, we we can acknowledge that here in Rhode Island, we're lucky enough to be able to do it, uh, to, to do it on our scale and do it well. Um, I did want to acknowledge in the chat that we're calling on some people who have uh, some hands raised. KM, K McDonald, maybe? Kyle, yep. Hi. I just have a comment. Um, I'm here with Michael Bressler. Michael, can you say hi? So Michael and I both work at Hasbro Children's Hospital. I'm the healing arts coordinator, and we work directly in the behavioral health unit. Um, and as you know, there's a mental health crisis in the state. So by the time the kids come to us, they're in crisis. You know, they're coming out of the school. Uh, sometimes they spend anywhere from two weeks to months in our unit. After that, they go into a step-down program, a partial program, which is usually six weeks. 
all of these programs have um, an incredibly robust art component. And we see the arts as a coping skill for kids. And, you know, we have kids who come in, they've, you know, they're suicidal, they practice self-harm, and they'll learn to play the ukulele. You know, Michael gives ukulele lessons and keyboard lessons every week, or they'll learn to practice origami. And they take these skills and they actually use it when they're feeling anxious. And instead of harming themselves, they have a skill that they can take with them, you know, pick up a, 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 an instrument or, or do a painting or something. But what we find is there's not any support after the um, discharge. So I get a phone call every week from a desperate parent who says their child, you know, was in BHU and then in PHP and now they're back in the school system. And, you know, they're getting art in school, but there's no community resource for them. And they ask if we have an art therapy program or do we have any outpatient programs, which we don't. So I think for us, that seems to be the big missing link because we are an ecosystem, you know, the school, the hospital, the community. Um, and if somehow we could bridge that gap, especially for these kids that are truly in life or death type of crisis to offer them something when they come out so that they feel supported. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And I also see some comments in the in the chat from Michael um, Tape Art, you know, going back to this idea of we need arts. Arts is part of the whole picture. It's part of our holistic whole of being human. And so this idea over time where it's been like a fix or a band-aid later on, it's not. It just needs to be part of what we do at every level. And as Maggie said about like a budget being a moral document, you know, at any, whether it's in an education institution, you know, an education place, a hospital, like we need to be thinking that this is part of it, right? Like we have all kinds of things of how we human and how we treat people, but it needs to be integrated. That's the common theme that I keep hearing. Like wherever we go, we need to be educated here from what we're doing and advocating at every level, like who, who are our people who control the funds at any place and any organization and any, you know, um, at the schools and, and be talking about this, as Gloria said, making some noise in some ways, right, but being informed about that. It's really important. This integration from an early on and not a Band-Aid is really important. So I hear that. I, um, I am so glad you said what you said about kids who've been in a um, a program or even a step program or residential program, and they're um, back into a school setting and um, suddenly they're asked to take those coping skills and there's no, no way to implement or to continue. Um, we have started to work with individuals who have been in a step program um, with, with guidelines and getting permission to speak to clinical and support staff. And what we are finding is the success component may mean showing up for one particular scene and then that is that level of success. And so we build on that and we look at what the behavioral or the emotional conditions are. And um, I just also want to address how do you measure I think that came up in the chat. How do you measure all of this stuff that we're talking about? And here's the thing, you cannot measure self-confidence. You cannot measure um, empowerment. What you can measure is how a student takes steps towards succession and how students that you're working with complete a process-based project. So they step away from that project and they have this new sense of self that's attached to that process that was put in place. That's what you measure. You measure the output because that is something that is um, that teachers see, that parents see, that their peers see, that that wow, you know, I I could not even hold my head up, and suddenly I'm able to tell you how I feel. And um, so maybe it's tweaking those measurements, or it's a pre-assessment or a post-assessment that just looks at self-care tools. True, and I think it's also just a shift in when we think about that those pieces are important. 
that we value those things initially, right? Like that we're not all about statistics. We're about the stories and the humans and what people's experiences are or the processes that are happening and that that is valuable even if we can't measure it. So if we set those expectations, it's important. Um, and yes, I see Steven has his hand up. Hello, thank you, Anisha. Um, I really wanna thank uh, Gloria for, for mentioning this piece about measuring. I think it's important to just acknowledge up front that we, you know, what you can't measure, you can document. Mm -hmm. And all of this becomes important information. We, um, I, I'm gonna encourage Riska to add some, some way of measuring health outcomes to the data dashboard that are related to you know, the arts that are happening, happening in the schools. Um, and, and just put on the table, um, the partnership with RISCA that the Department of Health has built has, like she told you, stood up this artisan residence program, which we are using as a tool at the Department of Health to really begin to embed partnerships um, with not just artists, but with folks across different sectors like education, um, where we can be at the table and kind of help as well. And so we know in public health that only 10% of you know, any individual's health and well-being is related to that relationship with a clinical um, physician. The rest of it is what's happening where we eat, live, sleep, and play. And so that includes school. And so the things that you all have been talking about doing, you know, they impact a young person now today, but for the rest of their lives. And so I think it's important to think about not just um, measuring, but documenting so that um, partners like myself can actually get to the table with you and um, you know participate in in some solutions. Thank you, Stephen. I was just checking to see, am I missing someone else's hand up or? And everybody that's dropping um, links in the chat, thank you so much. We're grabbing those and we'll um, we'll keep those and look into those. We appreciate everything you're sharing. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And we're trying to quickly scan, make sure that we're we're um, not missing anything. Are there any more questions? Anissa, did you want to share our our final resources? Sure. Yep. Okay. I want, to, I want to thank all our presenters again um, and all of the attendees here for taking time to join us today because we do recognize as been articulated that there is a crisis and there's no easy answers. Um, but we hope by spotlighting, making some noise, um, uh, the need, you know, we're, we're spotlighting that there is a need out here and sharing our, expense, our experiences and resources it gives us a time to come together. It gives us time to reflect on what we're doing individually or collectively. Um, it gives us time to reset. Um, it gives us maybe some new tools and connections and inspiration um, to help us support each other as we move forward. We know none of this is easy, but I think by again, highlighting this and coming together that um, you know we, we make a bigger argument um, and sharing studies and stories and documentation is very helpful to um, hear some resources. And in addition to what's in the chat, as Maggie said, we will uh, share things back as a follow-up with everybody. And um, I wanna thank again, everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Riska. Thank, thank you. you so thank you all. Really a, a brilliant, shining conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'm yes. so proud of my God. Good job, Kylie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.